Welcome to the lecture on the energy technology revolution. The statement here, what is needed is nothing short of an energy revolution, was issued about 12 years ago by the International Energy Agency. It is a very radical statement and it is of course mainly motivated by the climate crisis we are in and by the major contribution of our energy supply to anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. So in this lecture we want to investigate the different aspects of the energy technology revolution. First restating the importance of the climate challenge and its relation to energy supply, then the renewable energy potentials worldwide and then the drivers and the pathways for the energy revolution, then a short outlook on energy system models that are needed to illustrate future pathways for the energy revolution, finally a quick overview about energy policy. Despite all the progress and important progress on renewable energy, the fossil energy carriers are still dominating global energy supply. Here we can see both on an absolute scale on the left side and on a relative scale on the right side, the share of coal and the total coal-based electricity generated is still substantial in many countries and also overall on the planet. Natural gas is another fossil energy carrier that provides more energy per carbon emissions than coal and as a consequence many countries have increased their natural gas production. For example the US have actually turned from a net importer of natural gas to a net export of natural gas over the last years because of the so-called shale gas revolution meaning that a lot of new supply is being produced from mining shale gas reservoirs. The contribution of natural gas to overall emissions reduction is debated. It is clear that when shifting from coal to natural gas you can reduce emissions by about 50 percent or even more and still deliver the same amount of energy at similar cost and same reliability. The problem is that our global energy consumption has reached a magnitude where this shift alone is not enough. And that means many people now see the natural gas as a bridge technology. It's good that it replaces coal, so you shut down coal-fired power stations for example switch to natural gas and relatively low carbon price will already make this decision economic. But in the longer run, natural gas itself will not be sufficient for reaching ambitious climate targets and we would need to move on to low carbon renewable energy or to carbon capture and storage. So when we look at these curves, the global emissions pathways, you see that on the left side for the annual emissions we have very steep reductions ahead of us if you want to be anywhere near to a sustainable climate future. And those reductions that are necessary actually triggered a major paradigm shift. If I would have held this lecture 30 years ago, I would have reported a lot of the debate about the so-called peak oil, so the fear that the easy available fossil fuels will soon be out of stock and we will peak global production and the economy will thus crash. But today we have a very different picture. There have been many more discoveries recently and technology for producing fossil fuels has advanced a lot. For example, the shale gas production. So now we are in a very different situation. Instead of fearing that we, the global fossil fuel production might soon peak, we actually want it to peak and leave all the discovered resources that we have in the ground. So here on the left side you see from this nature paper that the budget that we have yet left to emit is the green bar on the left side of the right plot here. And the red and reddish bars on the right side here are the emissions that are still buried underground in the fossil fuel reserves that would be emitted if we produce all these fuels. So you see for all carriers, oil, gas, hard coal and lignite, 
For each carry alone, emissions equal the remaining budget or even larger. We have to leave the stuff in the ground. This is the message here. And this is a complete new situation. There is no scarcity anymore. There is abundance of fossil fuels, but we need to move away from it. On the other side, we have the renewable energy potentials, and they are substantial. If you see that the average world energy use divided by the accounting period one year is about 15 terawatt. So all energy converting devices and their power, average power of the year added globally leaves you with 15 terawatt. And you see solar energy, so just the solar irradiation is 120,000 terawatt. It's much, much more than we reasonably will consume in the future. Bioenergy in principle is also much larger, though there are different concerns about impacts and land use, and also the other energy sources can make a sound contribution, but solar outcompetes them all. Now let's do this whole thing a bit more tangibly. What we can do is we can try to understand the energy density of different renewable energy carriers. What do we mean by that? Imagine you have a wind farm, then you have wind turbines in a certain distance, and these wind turbines will generate electricity over the year. Now you can divide the electricity generated in one year by that one year to get the average power of the wind park, and you divide it another time by the area of the wind park. This gives you the average power density of that area. For wind, it's about 2 watts per square meter. Well, is that a lot or not? We don't know yet. We have to put it in context. If we use natural vegetation instead, a forest, field or grassland, we find that photosynthesis, so plants, roughly have an energy density of half a watt. If you use energy crops, maybe it's 1.5 watts per square meter. So wind is more area efficient than using photosynthesis in this database roughly by a factor of 4. Interestingly, when we move on to solar PV panels, we have energy, sorry, power densities of 5 to 20 watts per square meter with irradiation in some other southern countries with more sunshine, it would be much more. So let's take this comparison here. Half a watt per square meter on average for plants, 20 watts per square meter for modern efficient solar PV. That's a factor of 40. That means with one square kilometer of land or any other area, if you use PV panels instead of a forest or a field, you get 40 times as much energy from the same area. These calculations are extremely important to understand when we want to plan renewable energy strategies for entire countries. We need to know how much area we need. So here you see the calculation done by the author of the book, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. We do two things. First of all, we take our energy demand, the car travel, the flying, the heating, the cooking, the cooling, the food consumption and so on and calculate the different average energy consumption rates. We know how much energy we need to drive our car over the entire year, and we can convert this into kilowatt hours per day, which if you use your car in a normal fashion in uh, high income countries, you end up in putting 40 kilowatt hours per day in your car. And on the right side, you have the total stack of the different energy consumption categories. And the one next to it, the green one, is where the energy could come from. So a very optimistic scenario of putting PV panels wherever it's possible, large parts of the country with wind turbines and so on. And you see at first glance that energy demand and energy supply roughly meet. So this is a case study for the UK. It looks like as if the UK could be roughly self-sufficient with renewable energy. And if the red part, the energy demand, is delivered even more efficiently, maybe it could even be a net export. Well, but there's caveats to it, of course. What you see here on the green side, the energy supply from renewable energy is a very optimistic estimate done by an engineer. 
Now, the author of the book took his own estimate of what he thinks is maximally possible, the very left bar here, and compared it to what other renewable energy experts said is practically possible, including political regulations, acceptance, and so on. So you see these other columns with the small green bars here. These five agencies are the promoters of renewable energy. And what they think is realistic is much, much less than what the engineer said is maximally possible. So you see there's a big gap between what's technically feasible and between what's practically achievable. And if you compare the actual demand, which is not debated because we know what our energy demand is, the big red bar here, 125 kilowatt hours per day per person, compare it with the expected realistic potential for renewable energies, the small green bar on the right, you see suddenly, if you really think in terms of political, economic, feasible, discrepancy is quite a lot. Well, this is a snapshot from the late 2000s, so it's about 12 years old, and happily things have changed. Solar energy has become more efficient, offshore wind has arrived, and so on. Many things are possible now, so the balance of what we can do with renewable energy in terms of what we need gets better and better. But, especially for densely populated regions, there is still a gap between local energy demand and local energy supply. And there's nothing better to illustrate the challenges of densely populated areas than looking at cities. So these graphs are taken from a recent paper trying to understand the self-sufficiency potential for renewable energy in densely populated areas. So here you see on the x-axis the population density and on the y-axis the total final energy consumption that is possible. x-axis persons per square kilometer, y-axis gigajoule per person. How is this graph to be interpreted? You see these lines here and these lines are for different renewable energy types and have different power density. Before I said that power densities are measures to define how much power or energy you can harvest from a certain area. The higher the power density, the more people you can supply with a given total energy demand. Or vice versa, if you have a certain population density and a given final energy demand, you by definition have a certain power density. You see here that the area inefficient renewable energies like crops between half watt per square meter and 1.7 watt per square meters allow for relatively low population densities for a given final energy demand. If you move to the right, you see that with wind you can harvest more, with solar PV you can even harvest more, and if you go to solar hot water, which is more or less the most abundant renewable energy, then you can reach even higher power density and thus supply higher population densities for a given energy consumption. The dots in this graph are the different cities divided by continent. So you see the cities are on a line that roughly fits the solar PV lower volume. So it seems like if we would plaster all our cities full with PV modules, we could be self-sufficient without additional energy supply. Well, this is of course only a simplified picture, but it still shows you the relation between population density and the area needed to supply them with energy. We can zoom in through this graph and have the same plot, but this time just for transport. I won't go into detail, but of course, since transport energy is only a fraction of total energy demand, the transport energy for different cities can be harvested with smaller areas than the total energy. When we talk about energy revolution, we need to look at all steps of the energy service cascade. What is that? The energy service cascade is the entire transformation step from the natural resources to human well-being. There is no natural law that tells you to reach a certain well-being, you have to consume so and so much energy. In fact, there are many factors that link well-being to energy consumption. Well-being is partly delivered by the services that we enjoy, the shelter, the transport, communication. 
And depending on our lifestyle and infrastructure around us, these services are provided by different products, cars, fridges, telephone, and so on. The products need energy for the operation. So this is the green part, the energy demand cascade. Now we match energy demand and supply. On the supply side, we have the different conversion technologies with all different efficiencies. We then have the different energy technologies, energy harvesting technologies, and the available resources. And each arrow in this graph presents an opportunity for decoupling. We can decouple well-being from services, for example, by focusing on other values than just consumption. We can decouple products from energy demand, for example, by building more energy efficient products. We can decouple energy supply from energy technology or energy use, primary energy use, by making energy conversion more efficient. And all these steps contribute. We do not know how much. We have scenarios for how the future could look like. For example, here, the International Energy Agency put out a scenario some years ago. And you see, it's not a single technology or strategy. It's a wide range of strategies, starting all from carbon capture and storage CCS, going on to nuclear, renewables energy, and of course, all kinds of efficiency and also fuel switching. So the entire service cascade is kind of captured here with these different measures and we don't know exactly how the different measures will contribute in the future but we know that we will need all of them. How do we actually implement the future? One of the most important drivers for a sustainable future is of course that there is a business case for them. It must be affordable for people and commercial operators need to be profitable when embarking on renewable energies. Technological progress has made it possible that for many renewable energy carriers we have a business case today compared to the fossil fuel competitors. Or, speaking in different words, the costs for most renewable energy projects is now within the range of the fossil project costs. So there is no financial argument anymore against most renewable projects. This is a major advance and would not have been possible without the tremendous effort in technology development over the last decades and not without the tremendous investments in the early, even though they were still inefficient, renewable energy technologies to scale up to provide technology learning to give the producers the capital, the income needed to invest in further research and development and so on. So we now have a situation where renewable energies can compete with the fossil energies and this is one of the main drivers of course of the future energy transition and will hopefully help that the renewable energies will start replacing fossil fuels at the larger scale. But it's not that easy. As demand for energy shifts from fossil fuels to renewables, the price of fossil fuels will also decrease. But this stabilizes the system. A decreasing price means it's still attractive to use them. So in the worst case, we would have an increasing supply of renewables and an increasing consumption of fossil fuels, especially oil, because we have so much infrastructure in place, uh, companies are willing to sell even at low prices. So one way of fighting this economic logic and actually reducing fossil fuel consumption is to put an even higher carbon tax and also to provide alternative business models for oil producing companies, for example, switching to renewables. So economic logic here is really important as well. It's not as easy as just supplying alternatives like renewable projects, we also have to think of how we can end the business case for the fossil competitors. Another issue that's also not very easy to understand, but it's crucial, is that we have a lot of different technology pathways, but not all of them are equally efficient. One of the most instructive examples is the question of how do we bring the renewable energy on the road, meaning transport driving a vehicle forward. Here three different technology routes are 
compared. They all start with renewably generated electricity, solar PV or wind-based electricity. And at the end, at the bottom of this graph, you have the transmission energy going, moving the car forward on the road. And three pathways are being compared. Left is the direct charging, meaning the battery electric vehicle. On the right, you have the hydrogen car and fuel cells. And the right is the so-called power to liquid. So you produce hydrogen and then you produce a liquid fuel to store the energy. And you see that these different pathways differ vastly in their efficiency. Electrolysis, so converting electricity to chemical energy and hydrogen, is still very inefficient, much more inefficient than storing the electricity directly chemically in a battery. So that alone leaves you with very high losses. So you can see that 95% of the electricity generated can be stored in the battery, whereas only 44% of the energy can be stored in the fuel. And then on top of that, you have the efficiency losses by the combustion engines or the fuel cells. So for the power to liquid, in the end, only 13% of the energy in the wind power will make it to power that actually moves the car forward. Whereas for the battery car, it's 73%. We made an own study of that some years ago and we actually found it can be more than 80%. But 13% means that 87% of the energy is lost. And lost means nobody pays for it. There is no business case. So even though this technology route is very attractive, because you could say, hey, there's value creation and chemicals, we can use them for other things as well. The overall process chain is so inefficient that it's hardly to believe, at least for experts, that there will be ever any meaningful business case at a large scale, notwithstanding niche solutions, but at the large scale compared to using battery electric vehicles. So when thinking about these alternatives, pathways, liquid fuel, CCU, carbon capture utilization, fuel cells, and so on, think about how is their overall efficiency compared to other alternatives. And this alone explains much more than a lot of discussions and policy processes, right? The overall efficiency dictates how much money you lose when you have an inefficient process chain. A similar story applies when we think about decarbonizing the chemical sector. The chemical sector, so producing plastics, producing detergents and so on, is an extremely energy and emission intensive sector. A lot of thermodynamic processes are involved, chemical reaction, heat supply, and so on. And in principle, it is possible to decarbonize this sector entirely. You switch all fuels, all energy to hydrogen, source from renewable electricity, and you use the carbon that you sequestered from previous combustion. And when you do this, you can slowly decarbonize the entire sector. This colored curve here show you the stacked carbon emissions mitigation potential in the entire chemistry sector when you invest additional electricity here on the x-axis to produce hydrogen to then decarbonize different chemical pathways. And depending on the emissions intensity of that additional electricity used, here written in the colorful numbers grams per kilowatt hour of CO2 equivalent, then you reach different carbon emissions levels. So currently the um, chemical sector emissions are about 4 gigatons and assuming you have zero grams of carbon per kilowatt hour, so carbon free electricity, and you take 20 petawatt hours of it, you see in here that this, this little dot here, you can reduce emissions from build more than four down to half of a gigaton. If your carbon intensity is maybe 50, which is roughly the solar PV today, you can still be at around one gigaton or one and a half. So taking out two thirds and more of emissions. That's very impressive. But now again, we need to compare these chemical sector options with the other options we have. And this is done here by the gray curves. So if you look what's written there, there's heat pumps, replacing natural gas boilers, there's electromobility replacing gasoline and diesel, and there's electric boilers 
he uh, replacing lateral gas boilers. For those, the curves are much steeper, meaning that you get much more emission saving per energy invested. And in the foreseeable future, renewable energy, even though it's cheaply produced, will still be scarce, meaning there will be much less renewable low carbon energy than we would like to have. And this graph tells you that some options for using this energy are more carbon efficient than others. So you would save many more carbon emissions by switching the vehicles to electric vehicles than investing it in the chemical sector. Doesn't mean that we should not invest it in the chemical sectors, but it means that the savings elsewhere are higher and the chemical sectors would probably first see that other decarbonization strategies can be done, for example, more recycling or switching to different feedstocks and so on. So you see here again, the comparative and the systems perspective are really important to understand when we want to figure out what to do with the energy we have, how should we, or sorry, which strategies should we prioritize in the energy revolution. Also important in understanding the dynamics of the energy revolution is that existing infrastructure does not disappear overnight. We have inertia from the lifetime of existing assets. For example, when you buy a car, you typically will use it for 15 years before you buy a new car. And that means during these 15 years, no new technology will enter your household. If you buy a building, these investment intervals and technology exchange intervals are even longer. So the pathways we can take for the energy revolution are constrained by the capital stock we have already built up. And here we have an example, a study from 2010, showing the invested emissions, so to say. So emissions that will happen more or less anyway, because the capital assets for doing that already exist. The heaters in the households, the blast furnaces in the steel industry, the combustion engines, and so on. So you see the contribution of the different sectors here on the left side to those committed emissions, they are often called, and on the right side you see in which region they are. Of course this can change, we can prematurely take certain assets out of operation, replace them by more efficient ones, but if you just take the standard lifetimes that we have now, you see that a large number of emissions already is, so to say, factored into the system. Another bottleneck to the energy revolution is that many processes have emissions that are not easy to mitigate. One example is the steel industry. The steel industry uses most of their energy of reducing iron ore. Its iron ore is iron oxide, so you need to strip off the oxide, the oxygen atoms from the iron atoms to have pure iron in the end. This process is traditionally done using coke, which is a coal product. And it cannot easily be electrified. You would have to rethink, rebuild the entire industry, for example, using hydrogen, with, with we just learned is rather inefficient. So the steel industry has a huge challenge. They thought that carbon capture and storage could do the job, but this is now not working in most countries, right? There's not really a business case. So the next hope they have is the hydrogen-based steel making, which works in principle, although there's still a lot of technology development to be done, but it will make steel a lot more expensive. We have similar challenges in other industries. The chemical sector is one, the cement industry also. So we have to figure factor in that emissions mitigation, it's easier in some sectors, especially those that are easy to electrify and more difficult in other sectors. The full spectrum of strategies for the energy technology revolution is wider than we have previously discussed. We also can consider carbon capture and storage, CCS, or bioenergy combined with carbon capture and storage, which is a negative emissions technology because the bioenergy would take out emissions from the air via photosynthesis. The CCS would generate useful energy and store the carbon emissions then down in the ground. We have direct air capture, meaning we use renewable energy that's also cheap, low carbon, 
to wash out CO2 from the air and then store it. And there's the nuclear strategies. Most energy system models and some policy scenarios include these strategies. In particular, the bioenergy CCS is a negative emissions technology that is now used as a so-called backstop technology in most energy scenarios to make sure that we have negative global emissions in the second half of the 21st century, else these scenarios would not be able to reach a climate target. There's a lot of uncertainty about these strategies. There's costs, there's acceptance issues, there's risks. For example, how safely is it to store the CO2 that was captured and sequestered underground? But a lot of investments and a lot of research and a lot of lobbying goes into these technologies because many people believe that to some extent we will actually need to rely on those technologies in the future. There's a lot more to say. You could have entire study programs about the different technologies, a lot of research being done here. I just want to mention some very rough aspects. And what we need to do now is to bring all these different aspects we have into one big picture. The capital inertia, the efficiency of the different pathways, the costs of the different technologies, the resources we have available, and so on. Energy demand. And this big modeling exercise and assessment exercise is done by the energy system and by the integrated assessment models. So these are computer models that contain an aggregate description of future society and from this derive future energy demand and mix it, sorry, match it with an energy supply scenario, taking into account the resource constraint, land constraint, uh, oil constraints, and so on. And this field of energy system and integrated assessment modeling is an own subfield of science. There are different models available. Typically, we say the partial equilibrium models are the ones that only model one market, which is the energy market. So typically, energy system models try to match the energy supply with demand against a certain economic background. Then we have general equilibrium models that try to model the entire economy, including labor markets, capital markets, price changes in other sectors once energy becomes cheaper or more expensive. And we have simulation models that try to have certain differential equations simulated. One effect um, has consequences on other parts of the economy, so certain uh, empirically verified equations are combined together. So all these model types exist and they are used for policy consulting, building on certain drivers like population is often given exogenously, service needs of the people are also given, then we have the resource constraints and each sector, sorry, each model then has a technology portfolio, so which technologies are allowed in a certain scenarios and also of course what are their energy costs, economic costs and also what is the technology choice algorithm in each model. Again, this is only information that these models exist and roughly what they do and what they're based on and how the results look like. We do not lecture here exactly how these models work and how they can be applied. This is of course then the subject of specific university teaching. Typical results here for example, from the global energy assessment, an exercise involving several integrated assessment models. We can here in the future for different regions say what is their energy demand, what is their energy supply and how does it come from, where does it come from. We can zoom into different sectors. Here, for example, transferred fuel demand, we can see that these models describe a gradual phase out of the fossil fuels and replacement by renewable energies like bioliquids and also hydrogen based liquids. And here it's already important to understand that these models do not provide forecasts. The world is too complex at this level to actually be forecast with some reasonable precision. Instead, these models illustrate possible futures and they say that each future is internally consistent. 
so that supply of energy meets demand of energy and everything is in line with the global resources and the climate target. And other results would then look like this here. We have a total scenario here, the so-called efficiency scenario with future energy supply mix. So you can see how historically the different energy carriers have evolved over time. And then as we switch to more end use efficiency in this scenario, we see on top of that, we have solar electricity to meet additional demand in the future. But then essentially uh, the other technologies will stay roughly the same. So a lot of things in this scenario will happen here with carbon capture and storage. But also here for energy supply, different stories are possible. So here we have a gradual phase out of coal, for example, a little bit of coal CCS, more bioenergy, more solar, more wind, and so on. And this scenario is even more extreme, a very rapid increase of energy also in the future, supplied by a wide range of energy supply technologies. Again, all these scenarios shown here are based on certain principles, certain storylines, but these are not forecasts of the future, just illustration of possible energy futures, both supply and demand futures, under a given policy and technology deployment scenario. Energy policy is a major pillar of the energy revolution, and again, there's dedicated research and also university teaching going on in this area. Here I want to just show you a brief overview. Here's a list of all the countries that have some form of renewable energy already in place. This was in 2015. So you can see many countries have something in place, many countries also more than one policy. So this is now for renewable electricity. And then we have the countries that have some obligations regarding renewable energy heating and cooling. And you see, these are not as many. So if this is an effective policy, it definitely should be taken up by more countries. Transport as a really important sector because transport volumes globally are still increasing. And we see that maybe half of the world, roughly or less, is covered by renewable energy transport options. For example, would be a promotion of electric vehicles and low carbon electricity. But also here, more can be done. So the rough overview shows you that the number of policies that we have on those different fields is increasing. But as you see from the number of countries, many countries that are not yet covered by policies. And of course, the fact that there is a policy doesn't yet mean it is effective. So we need policy design, policy assessment, and of course, the policy process itself to also support the energy revolution from the governance side. The energy revolution will deeply transform our energy supply and use system, and this will also affect social indicators like equality, access to energy, or access to revenue from the new energy installations. There has been a lot of research in identifying the social outcomes of different renewable energy policies and projects, and there's evidence that we can have positive effects, for example, of direct procurement policies of governments. Sometimes the effect is inconclusive, like subsidies, and it's also clear that there can be negative social outcomes, especially when you have renewable energy deployment projects, like hydro dams, where people have to be relocated, or feed and tariffs, of which often only the rich people benefit. And it's, of course, important to mitigate those negative impacts to also achieve the social sustainable development goals and to also promote the acceptance of the renewable energy transition. And in particular, the review that was done recently and that's quoted here finds that for the negative social impacts, there's three main factors. The first one is if the policy on renewable energy is designed on a way that the financing for this policy, for example, the subsidies, is passed on to all households in an untargeted manner, because then the low-income households will be hit the most, for example, when electricity prices increase. The other negative outcome on the social side is when a policy leads to a heavy cost increase of subsistence goods, like basic foods, basic shelter, heating, electricity, and so on. 
that again impacts the poorer households in an unproportional manner or when a policy is directly designed to benefit richer people only because only they are the ones who are able to invest so these are three major negative social outcomes that should be avoided in policy design so i want to stop this lecture here gave you some rough directions on what are the basic elements of the energy revolution it's of course only a glimpse on the big amount of scientific understanding modeling and then the policy design that is needed to make this a reality thank you for your attention